Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Natasha Iklanikov Householder. Uh, I am the Hamilton College Class of 83 uh, president currently. And I'd like to welcome you all to the inaugural Hamilton College Alumni College event for 2023. It's my great pleasure to introduce our classmate from the Class of 83, David Edwards and his professional associate, Buff Parham. Dave Edwards, sorry, David Edwards, I get too casual sometimes. David Edwards is a wealth advisor, president and founder of Heron Wealth in New York City. Heron Wealth provides financial planning, investment advice, tax and estate planning services to individuals and families across the United States and around the world. David graduated from Hamilton College with a concentration in history and mathematics and holds an MBA in general management from the Darden Graduate School of Business at the University of Virginia. Presenting with David today is Buff Parham. Buff Parham is president of Parham Associates, an executive communications coaching firm. Buff graduated from Stanford University with a BA in politics political science and philosophy. Prior to starting Parham Associates, Buff spent several decades in management and sales roles with the Univision Television Group. It is my great pleasure to turn it over to David and Buff to talk to us about rewirement in our <laughs> approaching retirement days. Good so topic. David, uh, <laughs> David, Buff, I pass it to you. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, this is actually the, the third webinar uh, seminar I've done in the last 15 years. The first two were live in person. Uh, and obviously, it's a, it's a Zoom world, so happy to do it on Zoom. Um, about, about two years ago, when the COVID crisis started out, March 2020, um, I found myself in the situation of having to, um, to connect with my clients very rapidly and um, be able to answer questions very quickly. And so I started doing Zoom seminars. And my wife, Randy Kaufman, who's on the line somewhere, um, who's not pleased with the initial results. <laughs> so she connected me with Buff, uh, who's a communications expert. And between the two of us, we, uh, we, we tweaked things over time and we got all the, those, um, all the, uh, the rope hatches smoothed out. So uh, our format tonight, Buff is going to ask me some questions that came up uh, as we were planning this. We're going to go to uh, to the half hour. And then we'll open up uh, the chat system to uh, questions along the way. If you have questions in that first three minutes, put them in the chat box and uh, Bob will read them off. Right? So, Bob, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Are you ready to get the show on the road? Ready to get the show on the road. Well, David, as a wealth advisor who ensures the retirement of your clients, can you start us off with a story of a good retirement? I would love to. I'm going to tell the story of Simon, who is not a client of mine, he's a classmate of mine from high school. Uh, Simon went to art school in two years back in the, in the early 80s, and then um, quit art school and started out a photography practice. And he was the kind of person who would save 25% of his income. So uh, within a couple of years, he took over uh, the prime lease on a, on a rental loft and then subcontracted the space out to other, other um, photographers. And by the age of 30, we accumulated enough money to retire at age 30. I said, dude, what's up with that? He goes, well, you know, um, I learned how to do photography in the analog world, but now it's a digital world. All these kids are coming out of RISD and they can do what I do in seconds. It's not fun anymore. And I said, well, what are you gonna do next? He goes, oh, I'm just gonna retire. Mm -hmm. And that didn't last very long. When you're 30 years old, retirement is really boring. Like, you got to play golf every day? Nobody wants to hear about it. <laughs> so after a little while, he went back to school and picked up a BA in, in marketing and then used his knowledge of, of graphics and digital interfacing to go work at this new company, uh, AOL. Got some stock from that, did that for a few years, and then jumped uh, from space to space to space, always with the luxury of knowing that working was optional. He didn't, he didn't exactly sit either. He and his wife, uh, who's also an executive, bought a, a townhouse in Brooklyn. They bought a country house in Connecticut. Um, they travel um, extensively, but always, always, always building up um, 
their their savings and income so that whatever they want to do, working is optional. So he's not a client of mine because he's among the 2% of Americans that actually know how to do this and make it work properly. Uh, whatever, uh, you know, so these days he's still working, but according to his schedule, and when he's not working as a consultant in marketing, he's also working in woodworking. He designs and builds beautiful furniture. So whenever I have a question about what power tool I, I could buy, I have two choices. I, either I could spend, you know, days or weeks researching on Amazon, or I just call Simon. He knows the answer. <laughs> so I regard the way that he approached things as perfect. Um, you know, these days, a lot of people talk about the FIRE, the FIRE um, approach, financially independent, retire early. Yeah, but it's not really a, a nice life. You, you scream, you say, you don't spend any money, you buy, always buy used cars. Far better to, you know, get yourself in a good situation, get some income going, but then save as much as you can and invest it wisely and, and go from there. So we'll talk about other clients as we go along, but that's a good example of a client who's done right. Now you titled this webinar, Rewirement, Not Retirement. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah. So in the olden days, <laughs> worked for the same company for 40 years, right. and then that you get a gold watch and a pension. Hmm. And first off, nobody works for anybody for 40 years anymore. And secondly, unless you work for federal government, state, or city governments, there's no pensions anymore either. Hmm. So it's 100% on you to figure out uh, how retirement's going to be. But also, you know, work is very stimulating. And the fastest way to age rapidly is to have nothing to do with your mind at the end of at the end of at the end of the day. So as my clients get into their 50s and 60s, I ask them this one very simple question. If you had enough income, what would you do instead? And it's very interesting what people have done. For example, um, I have one client who was in the Navy for 20 years and then in consulting for 15 years, and now she is a minister. I have another client who is an insurance executive for most of his life, and now he is a minister. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know, ministry, emotionally very rewarding, but financially it's a struggle. And so people find that they can come to this, this um, activity late in life when their finances are taken care of and they can concentrate on the, on the, on the topic. Um, my friend Simon, right? When he retires for, for good from being a marketing consultant, he will still be doing woodworking until the day he dies. <laughs> so I would say most of the people on this call are in their early 50s to late 60s. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who's retired, who's not retired. But, you know, when we do financial planning for clients, we project their age, their longevity to age 95. If you have reasonable health, and you have parents that you know died in their in the 80s, it's not unreasonable that you would die at 90, 95, or even 100. I've got a couple of clients in their late 90s. And when you think about retiring at age 60 or age 70, and then you're going to age 90, 95, or 100, that's two or three decades you've got to come up with, with things to do. So somebody just commented that they cut they work for 38 years, but I don't think they got to go watch. <laughs> <laughs> Saw that. Well, now that we all know that we're in the post gold watch world and we're really responsible for our own retirement planning, what are the mistakes that you see people making as they take on this critical task? Yeah, it was so nice when you retired and got a pension and that was that. I often describe the process of, re of retiring as being similar to flying from London to JFK. In that fight, the plane doesn't just arrive at JFK at 35,000 feet and drop straight onto the runway. An hour in advance, the pilot calls ahead to um, the control tower, gets an update of the weather conditions, traffic conditions, gets a sense of uh, where they're going to be and that order coming in um, into, the, into the airport, calls back to the cabin crew, lets them know that people should start putting away their trays and their, their laptops and uh, put away the food service, get ready for, um, you know, a long gradual descent into the runway. And then as 
as time gets by, 30 minutes, 15 minutes to go, the pilot goes down a checklist of all the things that have to be put in place. So, for example, mm -hmm. I'm in a slow descent. Um, I have uh, uh, lowered my, my airspeed from 500 knots down to 150 knots. I understand what runway I'm going to. Um, uh, the flaps are extended. Those are the funny things you see on the side, the, the trailing edge of the wings. It was enabled to plane to sail off at, at low speeds. And most importantly, the pilot lowers and locks the landing gear. And we know the pilots that don't use checklists because every year in the United States, 100 aircraft land with the landing gear still up, which is both dangerous and expensive. <laughs> so um, at the end of this uh, webinar, I'm going to forward a checklist to the organizers and it's, it's one of several that we have. It's called the Pre-Retirement Preparedness Checklist. It's only two pages long. You can open it up with a glass of wine with your, with your partner or your spouse, go down that list and say, hey, is everything in, in place here for, for a good retirement? The other thing to remember is that, you know, just like with a, with a, with a landing on a runway, you only get one chance. It's the same thing with retirement. You only get one chance. And so, you know, for my clients, they usually come aboard in their, in their early 40s, late 40s, 50s, or whatever. We have 10 or 15 years to get it right. But even people that are retiring a year from now, two years from now, we still have time to get things right. Do you have some essential and practical keys to playing a realistic and realistic and achievable retirement that you can share right now? Yeah. Just, you know. Some of the basics. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that everybody should keep in mind. Whatever your investment assets are the day you retire, you can draw out between four and five percent of that money and never run out of money. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let's say you have a million dollars. You can draw forty to fifty thousand dollars a year from that portfolio and never run out of money. The actual portfolio is probably growing at six or seven percent a year. But we know that some years, like 21, the market can be up 20%. In other years, like 2022, it can be down 20%. So we need to keep a little bit of a buffer between our draw rate, 4 or 5%, and our actual return, 6%, 7%, to make sure we never draw down so much money that we can't recover on the other side. Um, I work with about 225 families. Maybe 125 of them are retired right now. In 27 years of running this firm, I've never had to cut someone's retirement draw. We always, we always say between the conservative 4% and the aggressive 5% um, uh, draw rate. There's some other mistakes that people make. A lot of times people think, oh, I'm retired. Now I must have a very safe portfolio. And they put their portfolio in bonds because bonds are not volatile. The problem with bonds is they don't make a lot of money. For the last decade, you were lucky to get 3%. Um, right now, because interest rates are up sharply, you can get 4%. Well, that's not enough to sustain that 4%, 5% draw rate. Um, so what I have my clients do is divide their assets into different buckets. Uh, we call it the, the, the waterfall strategy. So the biggest bucket is invested in U.S. stocks, uh, US stocks and international stocks. And that's growing 7 8 9% a year. A couple times a year, we pour the excess into the bond bucket. The bond bucket is making 3%, 4%, but it's less volatile. The excess of that flows into the cash bucket. The cash bucket is CDs and treasury bills, things like that, that has a very low heel, but has very little principal risk. And then each month, we put the exact same draw, the exact same paycheck replacement um, draw into their checking account. Now, some years, like... 2008, 2009, our risk bucket shrank dramatically. All right, whatever. We just turned off the waterfall for a couple of years and waited for the risk bucket to fill up again. Mm -hmm. And we can do that because the bond bucket and the, 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 uh, the cash bucket always have about five years to draw in there. So, you know, I look at, at my clients' portfolios. Hey, last year was a really tough year for, for stocks, but they're not having to cut anything. Their draw. They can support their charities, support their kids, do whatever they like, enjoy their life, and not worry about, um, about having enough cash. So that's what we call the three-bucket retirement income strategy. Um, there's another thing that we do, and we call it purpose-based asset allocation. 
generally speaking, if you have a financial need that's at least five years away, 100% equities. We want maximum growth. And if you have a need of the next year, right? Let's say you're funding a grandchild's tuition or you're putting an extension on your house. Well, we can't take any risk with that. It has to stay in, in cash. So um, faster growing assets like stocks are more volatile, go up and down. Lower yielding stocks like uh, lower yielding assets like T-bills barely grow at all. You want to have a mix of those three. Um, one other comment about the um, purpose-based asset allocation, I'll, I'll pass on that. Um, a third pointer is who, who should you work with if you decide you want to have a pilot on your, on your retirement? Mm -hmm. um, everybody has seen The Wolf of Wall Street, I'm pretty sure. I actually started my career <laughs> head of Jordan Belfort, probably right down the street. And when I saw that movie, I go, oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember those bad times. <laughs> here's, here's the good news. All of that craziness is, is now 25 years in the past. And anybody who's a Jordan Belfort type person has been, has been pushed out of the industry. And these days, you're going to work with potentially four, four types of, of um, advisors. Uh, an advisor like myself, I'm a registered investment advisor. I'm regulated by the SEC. I'm a fiduciary. That's very important. You might also work with a certified financial planner. A certified financial planner is also um, a fiduciary, and we have them on our staff, but they're not as well equipped to handle investments um, as our firm is. Um, and then you get into traditional brokers and insurance brokers. Um, some are very good, but they're not necessarily fiduciaries. And so if you ever find yourself in a conversation where somebody is going to product before they, they understand what your, what your desired outcome is, then you should probably move away. And let me describe what that conversation sounds like. Every time someone calls me for the first time, uh, we have what we call a hot topic conversation. Is it retirement? Is it your second home? Is it your children's education? Is it your aging parents? What's the number one hot topic on your mind? And only after we flesh that out and develop the full financial plan, can we start worrying about the investments. In a, in a different scenario, you might sit down with, a, with an advisor and then you might describe your problem and say, oh, wow, what you need is life insurance. Or, oh, wow, what you need is a municipal block. And those, those are more agents than the fiduciaries and generally you shy away from that. Got a couple of questions. This right. is kind of a question slash observation from Brian Emerson. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that rewiring is a lifelong or at least career long process. I like this role or not. Am I good at this or not? I value this or not. I want to move to a different geographic location, etc. Not mm -hmm. just finance, but intentional living. No, Brian is a, a great example. Brian and Laura uh, were investment bankers in Texas back in the 2000s and um, were very successful in that regard and used that money to buy a home off the grid about 65 miles north of Nome, Alaska, I think. Ryan, jump in if I got that wrong. And their intent was to live off the grid and learn everything it would take to survive as two people <laughs> far, far away from, you know, 911. And um, Ryan, do you want to chime in for a second and, and, and throw some comments about your experience doing that? Yeah, um, Dave. Sorry. Thanks so much for uh, for bringing it up. Um, you know, we as you as you mentioned, we did uh, Wall Street or the investment banking for a long time. Did fine, and then uh, you know the kids moved away, and we went to do something different. We'd uh, been to Alaska many times, and we thought, you know, we're in good health. Let's do something a little more kind of self reliant, fun. You know, be outside, enjoy the the fresh air, and try to grow more of our own food. And it's really been a wonderful learning experience. So I think that's kind of our version of rewiring. Right. But I think the question, but the question that Buff read was about, doesn't your topic rewiring apply to everybody, whether your kids are 20 or 40? Mm -hmm. they, sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody can rewire, which is great. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you, you guys made one major rewirement uh, starting about 12 years ago. And we may have another rewirement coming up um, a decade from now or, or, or two decades from now when you realize, oh my gosh, 
we're not physically strong enough to do this lifestyle here in Alaska. So what's our new plan? But you know, you, you had first. Uh, 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 Brian is an MBA from uh, Rice University, and so first you had the learning curve of getting through Hamilton, and then the learning curve of getting through Rice, and then uh, the learning curve of starting his business, Starlight, down in in, uh, in Texas. Laura uh, joined him uh, there; they got married. Um, and then this new learning curve um, of of living in Alaska, and that keeps your brain in the game. Mm-hmm. I love sure. it. Right. Thanks. It's also safe to say. I think that also the pandemic has uh, caused some force rewiring as well. <laughs> We've got an asset question here: uh, inflation protected securities, smart buy or not? Okay. So this is a classic product question, and the answer is I have no idea because I don't know <laughs> anything about the person asking this question. So I would say I don't know. So who, who, who asked that question? What was their name? Uh, let's see here. It was me, it's, it's, Ellen Hackle. Ellen. Ellen. So like if you have most of my money in stocks, but for some reason don't want to like really buy bonds, are inflation securities, because they're paying a pretty high interest right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a paying a high interest at, right now because... Inflation is high right now. It, I think it peaked about 8.5%. Now it's done 6.5%. Well, inflation securities, you know, rise very rapidly with inflation and they will fall off as well. And there's also limitations on how much money you can put in them as an individual um, person. So that is not going to solve the bigger problem that you have. I mean, inflation securities might be like 1% of a client's overall asset allocation. Now, what this, this you have to ask me if that makes sense. Uh, just tell me your approximate age, 50s, 60s. I'm, I'm in your class. I was graduating in 83. Oh, what, what in, was it? I didn't hear it. O'Looney, O'Looney, oh. economics oh. major. Hi. Oh, so both of my money is stocks, but, you know, place and protected securities. You know, I don't know. You are retired already or thinking about retiring five years or 10 years? Well, my husband earns the big bucks and he's still working, but I retired. Yeah. So um, what what other goals do you have besides retirement? Um, live financially comfortably without worrying, you know. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you want to travel at all? Do you want to give money to your kids? Do you, do you support pro bono activities? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. So these are all purposes, right? Mm-hmm. And um, when our clients have this kind of conversation with us, we sort of create a budget. Well, how much are we going to spend on on uh, pro bono? How much are we going to spend on travel? How much are we going to spend on uh, just you know living expenses? Do we want to buy a second house? Do we want to buy a smaller house? Do we want to swap things around? All right. In the, in the bad old days, we used to do these kind of conversations on spreadsheets, which just took forever. It was so frustrating. And these days, it's all cloud-based models. And as fast as our clients can come up with questions, we can come up with answers. So in, in my conversations, Ellen, with a, with, a, with a client, yeah, we might talk about the specific investments, but that's only 20% of my work. The other 80% is the financial planning, the tax planning, and the estate planning. Okay. I don't see, oh, here comes something. Um, thanks for sharing your expertise, David. Uh, class, uh, I'm 65, class of 80. Would like to know um, the wisdom of waiting to draw social at 70. Mm-hmm. Social security at 70. So yep. um, you can draw social security at early 66 or 68 or, or 70. And a lot of people want to grab it as early as possible because they've heard in the media that social security is going away. Yeah. Here's the news. It's never going away. Yeah, not happening. <laughs> not happening. <laughs> like, how are you going to go to Congress and convince, <laughs> you know, Congress people to you know, allow people to die in the streets? It's not going to happen. The third rail of politics. So, number one, don't worry about social security going away. Anyway, number two, do worry about the timing of it. Um, classic question I ask my clients is, how old were your parents when they passed away? So, um, Will, I'm going to just guess that your parents were 85 years old uh, when they passed away. 
Well, take take their age, average it. Had five 80, years. Eighty nine. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I don't have my camera on because I have this nineteen uh, eighties disco effect on Zoom. I don't know what it is, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna leave it off. Uh, but. Thanks very much, David, for, for sharing your expertise. As I said, my parents, uh, my, my dad was 89, my mom was 92. I'm, I'm a little bit different, probably from most of the people on the call at 65. I have an 11 year old son and I also mm -hmm. live in Brazil. So my final question is not even here, which is uh, what are some health options for me? I don't know if I should use, yeah, so let's, let's, let's do it. but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Your parents average age of death was, was 92. Add five years. You're going to make it to 97, number one. Not number the way two, I feel right now, but thanks, thanks for saying that. Anyway. <laughs> I, unless you die in a dumb accident, right? You know, okay. okay. Stay on the Amazon. <laughs> right. That's a big place. Yeah, it's easy to get lost and get hurt out there. All right. I live in uh, Sao Paulo. Also yeah, easy right. to get hurt and get lost out here. There are a lot of Americans who live very happily in Mexico just off Social Security. Right. Yep. Uh, it was very eye opening. I was I was doing an archaeological tour a couple of years ago, and all those Americans were there. <laughs> what did they see? Oh yeah, listen, we get thirty grand a month from uh, thirty grand a year from Social Security. Uh, that gives me a two bedroom house, a housekeeper, meals, everything. Like, huh? So, um, so your Social Security goes very far in Brazil if you live out the rest of your life there. You might even get free medical care. I know there's free medical care in, in Brazil. Um, there's still a big advantage to voting to 70. It's about a 3% about a um, differential between uh, 70 and 68, and that compounds over time. If you told me that both of your parents died in their 50s, I would say, well, hmm, mm -hmm. if I were you, I would take Social Security starting. Yeah, right. But you just told me that you have probably another 25 years to go, right? Uh, actually, 30 years to go, potentially. So you have that. <laughs> That compounding over 95 time. this is going to be great yeah <laughs> rich people live a very long time it's very interesting um <laughs> yeah three percent differential at age 65 would be a 50 percent differential when you're 95 so you definitely want to wait till 70 okay very good yeah the only the only the last the last thing to say is that i've been outside the united states working for the last 35 years. So my social security is, I'm looking at a difference between $650 and $875 if I wait until 70. So well, I don't know if that's enough to retire in Mexico, but it's, it's definitely not enough to retire here. Uh, let me make one other comment about social security. Um, social security is based on your top 20 earning years. Okay. Um, so the more you, the, you know, even, even if you, you don't write your income to your last decade of your career, you still can get $35,000 to $55,000 a year from Social yeah. Security. Uh, yeah. Another thing that people need to know is that um, when you have uh, two partners, uh, each, each of them draws Social Security, but then when one partner dies, the, the survivor gets ha um, the larger of the two. Right. So, um, you know, in the olden days when the wife was not working and the husband was making a lot of money, it didn't matter, it was always husbands. Well, now you have two people making a lot of money. It's kind of unfair. One loses part of the benefit. But we, we take that into, into effect when we're doing our calculations. I think we cleared the chat. It was one, <laughs> uh, there was a question there about uh, Social Security, low Congress tax benefits. Yeah, maybe. Right, right, your congressperson. David, um, I, have a, I have a question. Hi, Julie. Julia. So, so, um, I'm kind of afraid of retiring. I'm afraid of letting go my work world of identity. And mm -hmm. I'm also like, I'm a saver. So I'm like really afraid of the making that transition from earning and saving to spending it just feels like a lack of security for me, even though I've um, mm -hmm. saved a lot. So I wondered if you could talk us through yeah. how people experience those kind of fears and like how you, how you make the decision about What's the right time to retire or rewire, this even you know if you do have flexibility? Yeah, this is more common. You think people have been good? Uh, do, do you keep your your um, your unmute because I have some questions to ask you. Um, people have been good savers, good doobies their whole lives, and now they finally retire. I go, well, you can spend you know two hundred thousand dollars a year. 
They go, I can. They go, yeah, uh, <laughs> you can. They go, well, I don't want to. I go, okay, well, fine. But you're going to die with millions if you don't <laughs> get really creative on spending. So, Julia, um, pop back around for a second. Um, you said you were thinking about retiring. What, what, where do you live in the world, and what is your what is your career? I live in the Bay Area. I'm on my second career. I was a Wall Street lawyer, and now I'm in a nonprofit, fantastic nonprofit called Khan Academy. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's super fun, um, but it's also super draining. I mean, it is a full time, full on job. I got a husband that really wants me to quit this work nonsense, mm -hmm. and but I don't have anything that really is pulling me away from yeah. something that's engaging me well. Yeah. Um, but you don't have a unlimited time on the planet, right? I do want to have a lot of retirement years where I have an active body mm -hmm. um, and a an mm -hmm. husband with an active body. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but I don't have a crystal ball. So I'm trying to figure out what's the right time. And um, most really people can't imagine more than six to 12 months into the future. And it's because even though we live at the apex of human civilization, all of our reflexes are based on our, our cave person ancestors, right? They didn't worry about 10 years from now. They worried about surviving t tomorrow, next Tonight. week, <laughs> 12 months. And um, what's interesting about my job is that I can visualize my own death, you know, 30 years from now. And I'm, I'm going to make sure it's jam-packed the whole way through. <laughs> so you, you said that your husband is retired already? Yes. And if you... And um, your career path, by the way, is, is very typical. High-powered, uh, well-compensated job early on. Take those skills, drop down to an organization that desperate for skills. Right? Can't pay a lot, but it's mostly more rewarding. So it doesn't really sound like the money matters anymore. It's more like you don't know what you would do if you didn't have that job. Is that a fair assessment? Right. And I get a lot of gratification out of what I do at work or accomplishing, solving problems, like moving from what I do now to just like being on one or two nonprofit boards. And I just don't think that's enough engagement for mm -hmm. me, but I yeah, could but be wrong. Like travel or gardening or... Nothing mm -hmm. that I really want to leave my job to do 10 hours a week, you know, but I'm sure I could spend a lot of time traveling. I'm looking forward to reconnecting with all of my retiring classmates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have some thinking to do, right? I, I can't tell you where you will find joy and intellectual stimulation. You have to figure that out. Uh, but maybe you take a sabbatical from your current job, a month off or three months uh, or whatever, and use that time to reflect on what you could do downshift from being a full-time employee to being a, a board member or a consultant. Um, quite a few of my clients, you know, use the transition from five days a week to go to two days a week as a consultant. And then over time, ran it to one day a week and then down to zero. So that's, that's one option. David, one of your favorites just popped up in the chat. Mm -hmm. Do Bitcoin and or gold have a role in one's retirement portfolio? <laughs> If so, what percentage? <laughs> Buff notes my very strong opinion about Bitcoin. <laughs> You're not <laughs> shy. <laughs> so, again, we're confusing the outcomes with how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand U.S. stocks, they grow 8% a year. I understand international stocks, they grow 10% a year. I understand bonds, they grow 4% a year. Why? Because there's underlying value, right? If it's a stock, there's earnings from business. If it's a bond, there's, there's uh, interest income. There's underlying value. Gold has some value as an industrial commodity. You use it in electronics, you use it in jewelry. But gold as a store of value is worthless. <laughs> it goes up or down, you know, depending on the whims of the world. And you cannot rely on an income stream from that. The worst of all is Bitcoin. We will look back at this era as the biggest Ponzi scheme ever. All my clients wanted to be in Bitcoin back when it's ramping from 20 to 65. And I said, no, absolutely not. And then it fell from 65,000 back down to 18,000. Now it's back to 22,000. Don't care. It is simply not uh, a store of value. 
Uh, it is completely ephemeral. It has a huge negative impact on the environment. It, I doubt it'll even be around in five years. So um, stick to the boring stuff. Plain vanilla index ETFs. Amen. Question. Question. Uh, hi. Andrew. Yes, class of 66, Hamilton. Uh, I'm a retired film and comedy professor. Uh, do you advise at all that try to keep your sense of humor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely have to. Um, you know, so I've, I've had the pleasure of working with many, many interesting people in my time, and I've watched them grow up. Uh, you know, their adult children had babies. Those babies are now having their own babies. It's been really remarkable. And, you know, one of my favorite clients, uh, she died at age 92. She she kept her brain in the game until the very end. She was physically very frail. She had skin issues. She had eye issues. She lost a lot of weight. But she was an artist, and she still managed to paint every day. She gave up on, on oils because um, the, the oils bothered her eyes, but she kept the, water, the, the watercolors. And... The second you stop engaging with the rest of the world, that's when you're going to die within yeah. that time. So uh, whatever it takes to stay engaged, do it. it. Investing is one thing. And at day one of any comedy class I teach, I ask two questions. Number one, who in your family made you laugh when you were a kid? Your brother, mm -hmm. your father, your uncle, your mother. Mm -hmm. And some say nobody. And the second question is, what do you want on your tombstone? Because your tombstone is your last joke in mm -hmm. sense of humor. And I give them examples. Larry Gilbert made Tootsie and MASH and other films. His tombstone okay. says, finally, a plot. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'll see, my tombstone will be, he died doing what he's doing. What he going to do buried under a pile of snow or something stupid like that. <laughs> One Hollywood comedian's tombstone says, uh, I told you I wasn't feeling well. <laughs> so we're coming up on 5.38. I don't know if we have any more questions coming in. Let me just double check on the chat here. There's uh, one more here that you might want to take a slug at. It says, how much do you suggest we keep liquid for a rainy day fund if we're healthy? Low to take money out of our brokerage accounts to keep earning. Yeah, excellent question. So going back to that three bucket uh, retirement income strategy, um, if you have a year's worth of cash in your cash bucket, that's the right amount. And then four years at least in the bond bucket, that's five years now, which means that no matter what the stock market does, um, you'll be fine. They, you know, we all are pretty aware that last year the stock market fell 20%. Uh, some of us might remember the stock market fell 55%, <laughs> which means September uh, 2008, March 2009, that was the longest six months of my life. Um, they might not remember that the total return on the SP 500 from January 1st, 2000 until uh, December 31st, 2009 was 0.0%. We made, we made no money in stocks uh, for a decade. But along the way, the market was up, it was down, it was up, it was down. As long as you kept pouring the excess out into the bond bucket and the bond bucket and the cash bucket, you could ride out uh, that, that, that stretch. So. Use a little of them, keep a year of, of money in your cash, CDs, T T bills, um, checking accounts, savings accounts, four years in bonds at least, and then the rest in stocks for growth. Let's see here. I think we got to the end of the question. Yeah, I think we pretty well covers it. Uh, oh, yeah, 55%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Who again, forget that, right? Good person personality. You, if you obsess about last week's saber tooth tiger, you would never leave the cave. So our brains can't see much more than 12 months in, in, in the future and can barely remember what happened a month ago. Yeah. Uh, I'm always shocked when the news comes up and it says, oh yeah, 2018 this happened. I go, oh yeah, it did happen in 2018. Remember that now. Uh, Buffett, we had, a, we had a good close question. Let's go to that close question. Uh, on the chat? No, uh, from from our from our outline. I think we covered the outline. So the the, the one one really question we had was what what's my retirement plan? Oh, you want to keep that one? Okay, I thought you would. Let's keep that. <laughs> you want to get personal? I thought we'd like we drop that. Yeah, Go personal. for it. You know, I'm 61 years old, and I, I I know that you know my dad is 90, 
and my mom is 88. <laughs> so do the math on that. I got at least 95, right? Um, I don't want to stop working. I really enjoy my job. It's very rewarding and, and financially you know, helpful as well. But at the same time, I don't want to waste those last 10, 15 years of my life, 20 years of my life, when I'm still physically strong to do stuff. You know, the last 10 years of your life, you got to be very conscious of, of, of being frail. So um, I'm sort of changing my, my business so that um, I can time shift a lot. Like right now, for example, I'm not in New York City. I'm in Colorado. My wife and I are here for three weeks. We get up at six in the morning, work until 12, ski from 12 till four. Yesterday was the single best day of skiing of my entire life. And when I say past, that's because I was bouncing down moguls in extreme conditions. <laughs> that I've never been able to see that well before. But I have the financial resources, my wife and I have the financial resources to hire an expert coach who's also 61. He also knows, you know, my bones are the way they used to be. And he is working out the little kinks in my, in my uh, technique to enable me to really look good skiing moguls. I've got a longer term goal. Um, my other, my, my summertime sport is sailing. And I retired from aggressive racing about five years ago because the <laughs> guys on the boat are in their 20s and I'm 55. I feel like Tom Brady, you know, at the end of the day. Um, so I switched into a different element of sailing instead of around the movies racing, we you go home at the end of the day, long distance cruising. And, you know, like Brian, I've had to learn a lot more about wilderness um, uh, medicine techniques and navigation and, you know, electronics and diesel. You know, I'm taking a class in, in diesel uh, mechanics this spring to learn more about that, to be more self-reliant. And I find this, this whole new world of cruising and sailboats. It's an incredible learning curve. There's so much I don't know, but I now have the financial resources to hire people to teach me um, how to do this and eventually buy a decent sized boat. We're not going to sail around the world. That's that's a long, long amount of sailing. But to sail for a month at a time from New York to the Caribbean or from New York to to um, to, to Spain and then spend a summer sailing in um, in the Mediterranean and then sail back the following year, you know, following the route of, of Christopher Columbus. So I'm going to do everything possible to keep my brain engaged, you know, to the absolute bitter end. And I think that's a great place uh, to stop. Um, uh, Hamilton and, and Natasha, do you want to jump in with any uh, final comments? Just want to let everybody know who's on this call. And I mean, people who aren't here, <laughs> you will all get a link to this recording. So if you want to go back and look at anything, you know, review any of this information, which is wonderful information. Thank you so much, David and Buff. This is wonderful. And I'm a little younger than some of the people on this call, but it's very helpful to hear about this stuff now. Um, and I'll be following up in the next couple of days with that information. And also David's been generous enough to let me know that um, I'll be sharing his email. So if you do have follow-up questions, you can reach out to him individually. Thank you all very much for Thanks, being on the Dave. call. Thank your you, humor. Presenters. Yes, David and Buff, thank you so very much for kicking off the inaugural um, Alumni College event. It was really informative. I got some thinking to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. How about some uh, contact information, David. Why don't you plug yourself here? Uh, sure. Uh, David Edwards, Harry Wealth in the city. Uh, My uh, marketing uh, training. It's www. Somebody, somebody Wealth. typing that. Com. Um, so I'm sure that can be included in the email that's issued by the college. So yeah. that'll all be yeah. contained there. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for the Bye -bye. information. Great. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.